thank you. I think that's like the longest introduction I've ever had. I must really have made it. <laughs> and so I'm just thrilled to be here in St. Croix, to have moved to St. Croix to do this work, and also to be here with you tonight to share what I see is like why I'm why am I here is the topic tonight. If I can communicate to you and get you even a fraction as much excited about what we're going to be building upon um, with our new Coral Innovation Strategy, building upon the partnerships that Nate mentioned with the park, with the East End Marine Park, um, then you'll understand why I abandoned my life in Massachusetts and Canada to come down here uh, to do this work. And so I want this to be somewhat informal and you know, if you have a question that comes up, a burning question that can't wait till the end, then feel free to ask it as I go along. Um, and so I wanted to start by not only giving a visual of coral reefs, but also the sounds of coral reefs. This is what part of my passion is and what brought drew me to study coral reefs as a scientist was the sounds. And what you can see here, hopefully at least a little bit and appreciate, is how diverse coral reefs are, um, how many different species they harbor, and that they are the most diverse of all marine ecosystems. So we consider them the rainforest of the sea and equally their soundscape reflects that. So what you might not know is that all of the animals, uh, fish and invertebrates that live on a coral reef produce different sounds in their communication and that's something that I've been studying for the past few years in order to better understand that biodiversity and also how we might use that to monitor and protect coral reefs. But now I have journeyed to St. Croix in order to uh, undertake this effort along with the partners and team here and the Caribbean uh, wide nature conservancy efforts and um, I want to start by just going back to the, the beginning the foundation of coral reefs and ask what are corals does anyone have any thoughts ideas they want to <laughs> put out there what is a coral is it just a colorful rock Okay, it's an animal. Anything else? Okay, so it's made up of individual polyps. And you can kind of think of a coral as an animal, plant, and mineral, or at least does produce a rock. And it is a symbiosis between this polyp that also contains microscopic algae in its tissue that acts to photosynthesize and provide that organism with energy while the animal portion provides protection to uh, the, the plant. So it's a really unique special animal that forms this foundation of an entire ecosystem that is so important um, and supports an incredible amount of biodiversity and is diverse in itself. So, you know, there's thousands of species of coral with different types of polyps, different morphologies, different life histories. Um, and so, we have a problem though, in that coral cover has dramatically declined over the last decades. Um, you can see here, we've got a healthy, reef in 1975 and less than 30 years later it's pretty much completely dead and this is not uncommon in the Caribbean and can anyone tell me some of the reasons for these types of declines around the Caribbean what's that sure so climate warming is a problem sure so pollution human inputs Overfishing. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. People can shout out even if they know. We've got some experts in the room, so don't be shy. There's more. No? Sure. Generally, human impacts, um, in including those ones. Disease. Bleaching, again, due to warmth. Um, fishing. 
these are the major threats to our reefs. And you may wonder, okay, that's pretty bad for the coral. So sad. But why should we care if you're not someone who's in the water seeing that coral? Can we talk about the benefits of coral reefs outside of just sustaining this ecosystem in and of itself? Sure, so those fish <laughs> are really important. We like to eat fish. That is an economic boon. Well, it's a nursery too, so giant fish. Sure, so fishery, you know, coral reefs support 25% of the ocean's biodiversity, even though they only make up 1% to 2% of the habitat. This is really important. What about the tourism? Sure. Tourism is a huge industry in the Virgin Islands, in the Caribbean at large. Susan? If they're not a coral reef, what protection do they get from? Right, well, coral reefs provide protection in general. So shoreline protection is a major benefit of coral reefs and why we might care about them. Um, and this is quite a busy diagram, but the important part is that coral reefs are in the center of so much. And that's really what I'm trying to communicate and get us to think about is not only does it support fisheries and a ton of biodiversity that has other ecosystem functions such as nutrient cycling and gas exchange, um, they also stabilize the shoreline, they provide that protection, they buffer against 97% of storm surge if they're in the right places at the right time. So these are extremely important ecosystems uh, for people, especially people on islands. Uh, and so that is why TNC has developed a Caribbean coral strategy to promote scalable solutions to coral reef decline. So as Lisa mentioned in her introduction, the Nature Conservancy works in 17 countries and territories in the region, and that is a tremendous opportunity to combine forces to really take coral reef restoration, conservation to the next level and to match the magnitude of the problem. So we are going to be building upon what has been done over the last decades in all of these places, but really coordinating our efforts. And today I'm mostly going to talk to you about all of the technology and the new approaches that we're going to leverage to do this um, as a whole across the region, but also focus on how St. Croix and the Virgin Islands is going to become an a hub of innovation, leveraging those partnerships that we already have with government organizations. So these, this strategy includes three major pillars. Um, one is protection of coral, restoration of coral, and monitoring. And so I'm going to go through each of those and just a little bit about what that means um, before I dive into some of the unique approaches, the new uh, and ongoing work that we're doing here in St. Croix and across the region, of course. So protection really means removing those drivers of reef degradation. Uh, that's through things like marine protected areas and reducing fishing pressure. Restoration is actually growing new coral, producing and propagating coral that we can then plant out onto reefs and create new habitat. And then monitoring, which is using new technologies and innovative assessment techniques to make sure that we're targeting our in intervention. So where we're going to restore or protect is where we can make the most impact on the environment and people's lives. Um, and also to measure effectiveness. We don't want to be doing this work without actually making sure that it's effective. And so that's where, as we kind of go into this new era where we recognize that these interventions need to be over a bigger scale, we need to do things uh, to match the scale of the problem, we also need to ensure that it is working. And that's why none of these different pillars can work in isolation, just like 
the different groups here in St. Croix can't work in isolation and the different islands need to really be coming together to address this problem. The fish don't care about geographic boundaries and neither should we. And I want to start off by also talking about how important community engagement is as the foundation of all of this. So it's one thing for us to go out and plant some corals or protect some coral reefs or do some monitoring, but without communicating with the public, engaging the community, and especially youth, none of this will be sustainable as we move forward. So this is really key to our efforts and um, as I go through the presentation, I just want you to keep in mind I will circle back to how as we move forward we're really attempting, you know, not only with a lecture like this where I can hopefully make friends with the friends of St. Croix National Park Service, um, but also get your support or interest and ideas about how we can better make this a huge effort. So as I said, I'm going to focus on the U.S. Virgin Islands tonight. That's because I am managing the program here in the Virgin Islands. We're in the Virgin Islands. But I just wanted to give the context that this is not just um, us alone. And uh, we are a hub of this work, but we are coordinating with um, the different uh, islands and geographies uh, around the region. So. Before I talk about our new and upcoming work, I want to just mention what the foundation of our work here is. And um, Nate had already indicated that you know there's a long history of TNC in St. Croix and the Virgin Islands. And we've done a lot of these different components throughout the years. And what we're really trying to do is combine all these efforts and bring in new partnerships and existing partnerships to use the momentum that there is right now for coral reef restoration. Um, but one of the main things that has happened in the Virgin Islands uh, in the last decades has been protection and TNC's role in that has been supporting marine protected areas and marine spatial planning in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, as I said, removing those threats to coral reef ecosystems by tr trying to support those efforts of the parks, uh, including the St. Thomas East End Reserves and in St. Croix, the East End Marine Park. Um, and that brings in a lot of the, our restoration work and monitoring as well because we want to do our restoration work somewhere where the corals will be protected. And so a lot of our work is in the East End Marine Park um, with our partners in the East End Marine Park and Caroline Pot is here, so that's great. Um, and one of the tools that we can provide, for instance, and this is just an example, is a coastal vulnerability model. And this map shows um, where interventions might be most useful. This shows uh, a map of habitats around St. Croix where coral reefs and mangroves provide the most protection to the shoreline, uh, to storm surge. And so we also do restoration in the East End Marine Park and we're, we recently installed a nursery uh, with the East End Marine Park to grow coral that will then be outplanted and we're going to work with them to do monitoring. And so this is just sort of a quick snapshot of how we integrate these different programs all into one and sort of the more traditional way before I shift to talk about our bigger picture of how we're bringing in new technology, new techniques in well, we currently are doing it, and it's going to be a huge year here for coral work at the Nature Conservancy. Um, and part of that is because we have such a long history of doing this type of work here and having really effective partnerships in St. Croix and the rest of the Virgin Islands that the Nature Conservancy identified uh, St. Croix as a place to have this coral innovation hub. And so we are the uh, demonstration flagship place where a lot of this work is going to be brought all together. Uh, 
And today I'm going to focus mostly on this restoration and monitoring aspects of the work that we're going to be doing to promote these scalable solutions to coral reef decline. Uh, and I want to start by talking about the innovative restoration techniques that we are working on now and will continue in the coming years. And so the focus of this is really to develop and deploy a diverse set of techniques that maximize resiliency. So we know that the future has not seemed bright for coral. There's all of these environmental issues. So what we really need to do is increase genetic diversity, maximize their ability to adapt to a changing environment. Um, and with partners at Moat Marine Lab in Florida and uh, an international NGO called SeaCor, we are doing two different techniques to propagate corals. And one is uh, micro, called microfragmentation, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. And that's to really increase growth rates and our ability to culture more species of coral than we have in the past. And then uh, to harness the sexual reproduction, the natural reproductive events of coral to help those new baby corals become adult corals, uh, we are working with CCOR on that. So microfragmentation is, was developed a few years ago as a way to more quickly grow coral. So in this uh, method, you cut your corals into very small pieces and their growth rates are increased by 10 to 20 times. And this is an incredible advance because you may or may not know, but coral grow very slowly. And that is a huge barrier to being able to restore coral, coral reefs, um, especially for the slower growing species. And this is one reason why a lot of the efforts over the last few decades have been focused on the faster growing species, um, staghorn or elkhorn that you might be familiar with. Um, but with this microfragmentation technique, uh, there is a lot of evidence that we can grow coral faster and that as you saw in that little, in the video, that they'll actually uh, be able to merge into one and then become reproductive more quickly than ever before. This is probably a few months, but this is a, on a very small scale. So, oh no, that doesn't just happen. <laughs> very good, very good point. No, that would be amazing if I told you. Do not believe anyone if they say I can grow a coral in five five seconds. No, <laughs> this is still several months, but typically that process they might grow a few centimeters in a year. Uh, so this is actually uh, quite impressive, and we will be trying to do this technique here in St. Croix. It's uh, starting to be used in different places. And then, as I said, the second thing that's really important is to, like, we can only make so much new coral out of coral that already exists. We need to use their reproduction to produce more coral. I mean, that's how they would normally do it. The problem is, is that it's not very successful when you don't have a lot of coral for them to reproduce, right? So an extra issue for coral is that a lot of them spawn once per year. That means they have one night per year that the magic can happen. That's not good odds. So we want to help facilitate this process. And so that's where facilitated sexual reproduction techniques come in. And so this is showing a coral spawning. It's a spectacular event. People should be getting in the water and seeing this. We can talk about what day of the year, if you want to go on a night dive, it usually happens a couple hours after sunset, uh, after a certain lunar phase. It's all very carefully timed. And so with this technique, we are collecting those eggs and sperm bundles, fertilizing them in the lab. This is, you know, like a fertilization clinic for corals and growing them up past that bottleneck. When they first are larvae swimming around in the water, it's very dangerous. Most of them get eaten, most of them die. If we can get them through a few weeks even, 
or a month, then they have exponentially more possibility to survive long term. Um, in that video, you saw divers dispersing them out. It's like sowing seeds. So we're trying to take, you know, the approach. This is like silviculture. This is a uh, Farming. We're, we need to farm the coral, so we need to plant these seeds of coral uh, around the reefs. And so that's the second technique that we'll be employing. And so in St. Croix, where are we doing this? Well, the center of our efforts is Estate Little Princess is the nature preserve that we have um, just outside of, just in, west of Christiansted here. And that's really going to be the central node of our coral innovation hub, but we have in-water nurseries in Cane Bay where we grow coral in the water and we've recently um, put another in East End Marine Park near Channel Rock that we're calling Kraken Nursery. Um, and then as I said, there's a demonstration nursery in Kramer's Park as well. So snorkelers are welcome to visit that um, and Caroline can probably direct them to where that actually is. Uh, so we are diversifying our techniques, building upon Cane Bay, which has housed a coral nursery with one or two species. The staghorn or elkhorn has been very effective in growing those species and outplanting for several years, over a decade really. Um, but we want to grow more species use those different techniques, and diversify our facilities. We were very fortunate that Cane Bay Nursery survived the hurricane and actually was fairly robust to that storm. Um, it is quite incredible, which is why we want to keep <laughs> using that now. But it's good also to have the, a new nursery, especially in East End Marine Park, that is a protected area. Um, and Estate Little Princess is where we're going to have a land-based facility. So this is really about putting our eggs not in all one basket, diversifying the techniques, the approaches, the locations, and everything about this program. So this is just a quick snapshot of, that, of those nurseries in the water. Um, this is a, what we call a coral nursery tree. Um, the coral are hung there and they uh, grow and do quite well and thrive there until they are planted back out on the reef, um, refragmented and so, so this is the traditional method um, and we will continue doing a portion of our nursery will be this. Um, but last year we piloted doing that microfragmentation technique with other species uh, on a tree in the nursery and it turns out it's quite effective which is great news because in the past a lot of this was only done in one place in Florida and we need to show that it will work here and that we can use it and so then we can plant new species. So this year in 2019 over the last month or so um, a team from TNC has been out putting installing new nursery structures um, in order to test different techniques different structures to grow these different coral on, we're expanding to 12 different species. So that is going to be a tremendous, give us tremendous insight into what coral species we can grow where, because we're putting them in three different sites, and which is most effective, what uh, conditions provide the best environment for different species. Um, and so it's very exciting. The other exciting thing recently is how much the dolphins like our new nursery. <laughs> I know dolphins are charismatic. Some people, not Nate, think that dolphins are more charismatic than coral. But <laughs> so I thought I would at least include corals are also fan. I mean, coral. Dolphins are also fans of our coral nursery. Um, hopefully, they don't play with them. I've been hearing that sometimes they can be a little mischievous in these places. So let's see. Um, okay, so as I said, we are developing a coral innovation center, and that's to do all of this work, the protection, restoration, uh, monitoring, and our 
The real heart of this operation is the state Little Princess, um, where we have, I don't know, Lisa, how many acres do we have there? 27 acres. So we have a you know, tremendous nature preserve there. Um, unfortunately, like a lot of places, we sustained heavy damage um, in Hurricane Maria, and our buildings are not functional at the moment. Uh, so that has prolonged. This, this idea to have a coral innovation center was a few years in the making. This was before the storm, um, but we've slowed down a little bit in the last year. But now we are on our way to have a container-based uh, coral nursery and research center by the end of the summer. So we are going to continue forward with this, which is a demonstration of what we can do with a low cost of entry as well. And so the idea is that once we get a state little princess all functional, that's going to be the flagship support center where we can train uh, people. We can have coral gardeners come, research scientists, uh, user groups, you know, school groups, the community. We could have a lecture like this. Um, but the lab and the nursery on land is going to be a tremendous boon to the coral restoration work that we do. So these tanks are going to house up to 30,000 coral, I believe. Is that right, David? Uh, 15,000 every six months. Oh, 15,000 every six months, so 30,000 per year. <laughs> so this is going to help us uh, accelerate and expand that planting process, as I said. It's also going to allow us to manipulate the environmental conditions if we need to do experimental work. Um, we're going to have an indoor set of tanks as well to do more carefully controlled experiments and also as a fail safe, I guess, if something goes wrong outside. Um, and so we're very excited about this possibility. And not only is it a way for us to expand our own operations. It'll serve as an example of what could be done uh, for low, relatively low cost to set up a similar facility in different places, whether it's St. John, St. Thomas, around the region. Um, and of course, I talked about the sexual reproduction, the facilitated sexual reproduction. We're going to be doing that based out of this facility and we need somewhere to do all of this work um, to bring in those scientists to host workshops. So um, this is all part of the vision of this container facility. And as I said, it's coming late summer 2019, we hope. We've got the permits in <laughs> and uh, working on getting our uh, containers built now. So. That gives you an idea of what we're doing in terms of restoration coming up this year, currently, and into the future. But as I mentioned before, none of this can be done effectively without proper monitoring of the reef environment as it exists to inform where we put our coral to have the most impact and also to make sure that what we're doing is effective. Um, and so traditionally, Divers like myself and marine biologists, the part, like the Park Service, um, go out and we monitor coral reefs and we do transects and we record data. And this is a really great way to get a lot of detailed information about the reefs. Uh, but you can really only do apparently 100 square meters per hour is an estimate uh, in the Caribbean, there's 25,000 square kilometers. So if we do some math, we need 250 million hours. Uh, and that's to get one time point, right? And we might want to know what the reefs were like before a hurricane and after a hurricane and one month to another or as, you know, after I plant my new reef, I want to know what it's like. So we are trying to take this work, which is really important that we will continue to do, but to enhance it by deploying innovative assessment tools uh, 
in order to target the, these interventions properly and measure our effectiveness. So, as I said, along with SCUBA, we have access to boat drones uh, that can generate photo mosaics and 3D recreations so we can better understand the benthic habitat. We can use traditional drones that can image an entire bay in a single flight. Uh, we are now using specialized aircraft equipped with high resolution, hyper spectral imaging capabilities, and then all the way up to satellite arrays capable of imaging the entire Earth's surface at unprecedented resolution. So hopefully you can see all of these. And I guess I like to think of this multi-pronged approach just like building the coral reef. I mean, we're so at some point starting with a sperm and egg and going all the way to these huge structures that surround hopefully a whole coastline. Um, and we need to look at it from all of those scales. And of course, the Nature Conservancy is not doing this all on our own. I don't understand half of that stuff, and I'm a scientist. I need computer scientists, engineers, pilots, everyone on deck to do this. So we've partnered with Planet, uh, who has around 200 satellites that collects global data on a daily time step, and then the Carnegie Airborne Observatory, who does the high fidelity um, imaging, has this, uh, spectrometers uh, and multiple laser scanners that provides that really is pioneering coastal monitoring. Um, and getting us to taxonomic resolutions that we've never before seen. And of course, in this development phase, what's really important on the ground for us is continuing to do aerial drones, boat drones, these types of things, and scuba surveys to validate the data so that this could be used effectively in the future. Uh, and what is really exciting, well, so this part's not exciting, the hurricanes, but the fact that we have two time points and can use this high resolution satellite imagery to compare before and after hurricanes and much, have a much better understanding of the impact on our coastal habitats than ever before is an incredible advance. And then what is quite exciting is that the Carnegie Airborne Observatory did its first flights um, of coral reefs in the Caribbean in the Virgin Islands here in St. Croix uh, last April and we are starting to see the results of that and so the first I just want to go through I'm going to kind of give you an idea of this whole process because it's pretty cool and I'll talk about the fun how functional it is too but basically the satellite generates these ortho mosaics for the entire Caribbean um, and it has almost 40,000 scenes and I guess if you're a computer nurse nerd this is like quite exciting I don't know all <laughs> the, the details but it's over 15 terabytes per each mosaic um, but what we actually really like is that we can characterize coastal ecosystems so we want to zoom in on southeast St. Croix where we're using this technique to really visualize and understand what types of habitats there are here. And so we can then have the computer do a light attenu attenuation model. Um, I don't know all of the nuts and bolts of it, but it gives us good bathymetric da data so we can understand the depth of the coastal environment. And then combining that with the actual imagery, um, from the satellite images, we can identify these important geomorphic zones. So that would be the fore reef and back reef and the reef crest and understand the morphology of the reef around uh, an area. And then using very fancy computers, our partners and our lead scientists for the region, Steve Schill uh, and the Carnegie uh, scientists are developing basically like a machine learning cognitive network technology that uses not only the pixels in isolation but in combination and in that way they can make this adaptive map um, and so through this whole process 
as I mentioned before, one of the important things is that we are working together on the large scale and the small scale to validate this so that we can go out and say, is there actual coral reef there? Um, and just improve the computer's ability so that in the future it's going to hopefully have the right answer 100% of the time. And so, as I said, these are some of the different um, habitat types that we might be able to classify. And so with the Carnegie Airborne Observatory, this allows us to go into even greater detail and increase the resolution of the imagery and the habitat uh, classification down to within meters, so at the sub-meter resolution, and hundreds of spectral bands, which means that we could actually identify individual coral species from the air, which is unprecedented. Um, and so you can just see here the imagery that are produced. So these are the maps, the first draft of maps that are, uh, pr or were produced for the Virgin Islands. And so this is all really cool, right? Oh, wow, this is great. But I want to bring it back to make sure that we emphasize how functional they are. You know, we're not just looking to produce cool things. We're looking to produce things that when we really go from large to small scale, can be integrated to maximize effectiveness. And that's not just for us in our restoration efforts, but for partners that maybe want to look at things like mangroves and seagrass and all of the different coastal habitats. You know, these products will be used to do coastal vulnerability modeling, uh, you know, benthic habitat classification, a whole suite of uses. So it's it's really excited, exciting. And as I said, I just like to drive it home that, you know, I can spawn all these coral and we can grow all these coral, but we need to know where to put them, where we can predict that they might survive best, where they're going to make the most impact on our lives, the most stor storm protection, um, do the best, be protected. So we really need these types of tools to be able to do that. And then we also need to be able to go back later with things even like this, these drones and see did that reef that we planted, how is it doing? What's, what's going on there? Um, and so as I'm starting to wrap up, I just wanted to reiterate the th three pillars that are so important. Um, and what we're really trying to harness is we're, we're, we want this innovation hub and the others in Bahamas and Dominican Republic to be places where we draw upon all of the technology and skills and uh, research that's been done and make an impact. And that's why I was encouraged to come here and do this. You know, I was a scientist sitting in my lab doing one piece of the puzzle, but we're trying to bring it all together here and put out something that is dramatically more meaningful. Uh, and again, we can't do that without community engagement, especially youth engagement. Uh, and so we really need all hands on deck. And we need to grow, like, the part of the idea is to grow the coral gardeners, the coral, the coral farmers of the future, uh, retrain fishermen or get people involved in this industry that hopefully it will become. And so as we move into this new era of coral innovation, we're also very cognizant of bringing uh, the youth and community with us. And that's why it's going to be so imperative once we have our uh, center of innovation to incorporate them. For the moment, we're working with the Junior Scientists in the Sea, which is a program with the Caribbean Boys and Girls Club that trains uh, middle school and high school students to become scientific divers. So they're up to the American Academy of Underwater Sciences standard, and they are about to start working with us here in St. Croix on our nursery. So we have five uh, divers from that program on island who are between 13 and 18, and they're going to start being the ones to steward our nursery program in the water, and we just want to keep building on that. Um, and you know it's really important with our partners in the East End Marine Park for the demonstration nursery to get people out to see it uh, and see when we're doing micro fragmentation we will be promoting that as a way for people to come learn 
uh, and you know school programs getting kids in the water to see all of this and so before I take questions I just want to thank all of the personnel our team here is a really great group of scientists conservation practitioners lovers of the environment uh, we have always we will continue to have two interns that we are training throughout and hopefully a state little princess will return to what it once was but also even better than ever so with that um, I'd love to take questions or have discussion thank you so much